going to take a deeper dive into the genetic influence on dairy cow feed deficiency. And here to do that is Dr. Francisco Pina Garicano, Assistant Professor of Genetics and Genomics in the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences at the University of Florida. He is broadly interested in statistical and quantitative genetics and genomics in both the dairy and livestock industries. His research program focuses on the development and application of statistical and computational methods for the analysis of phenotypic and molecular data in livestock species. Francisco earned his PhD in animal science and a master's degree in statistics from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He also earned a master's degree in animal science in Uruguay. Join me in welcoming Dr. Francisco Pina Garicano. Yes. Thank you very much, uh, Peggy, for the introduction, and thanks, uh, Joao, for the invitation. It's great to be here. Uh, let me say uh, something. When um, uh, Mike Vanderhaar, he got the uh, uh, grant, 2009, right? 2008, 2009. I was in uh, kindergarten. So, <laughs> well, <laughs> not really. Uh, but I started my PhD in uh, 2010. So I was not directly involved in that grant. I'm fully engaged now in this uh, new grant that we have. So what I will do today is uh, I will go over some of the uh, findings of that um, grant in the context of genetic dissection of uh, feed efficiency. So what's the importance of feed efficiency? We already discussed this, right? Feed represents more than 50% of the total production cost. So what are the benefits of improving feed efficiency? Not only increase farm profitability, but also reduce the environmental impact of dairy farming, right? Because we will need less land. We will reduce uh, green gas emissions. I will argue that uh, genetic improvement of environmental sustainability trait, such as feed efficiency, it's very relevant nowadays, given the increasing concern of society about the environmental impact of, of the reforming. So our goal is to actually improve feed efficiency through genetic selection, right? So let me go over uh, this data most of us here, we are geneticists, but I know there are few nutritionists. So let me go over this data and first, what is the question? What is the importance of genetic selection? So this data here shows the change in milk production per cow per lactation in the last 60 years in this country. Easy to see, remarkable increase in milk production per cow per lactation in the last 60 years. Now, if we evaluate that change, we will see that 60% of that change is due to genetic selection. Only one factor, genetic selection, explains 60% of the change in meal production in this country in the last 60 years. And the rest here, I'm calling management. Of course, I'm putting together what is nutrition, cow uh, comfort, cow management, health. So if someone asks us, hey, what is the importance of genetic selection, based on this data, we should say that it's a very powerful tool, that it's a very cost-effective strategy that in the long term can achieve greater changes in um, the phenotype. The second question is, what's the importance of having genetic tools? I'm sure you have seen this data before. Again, in blue is the change in milk production in the last 60 years in this country. And in red, we have the change in pregnancy rate in the last 60 years, right? So until 2002, 2003, we observed a remarkable increase in milk production, and at the same time, a steady decrease in pregnancy rate. These two traits are um, uh, negatively correlated, right? And at that time, we were putting a lot of pressure in production traits, and we didn't have the tools to select for cow fertility. Now, Paul Van Raden, 
introduced in 2003 DPR. And DPR is actually the primary trait, the primary tool that we have in this country to select for cow fertility. And since 2002-2003, due to a combination of events, the development of repro programs, improvement in nutritional manage management, but also because now we can use uh, DPR in our selection programs, we now observe an uh, increase in pregnancy rate, and of course, we are still improving in production traits. So it's very important to have the genetic tools, right? Now in this country, we can select for postpartum diseases. Kristen is here in, in, the, in the audience, she has lead that, so now we can select for more resistant animals. We will have that for sure in the near future, and we expect in 2020, we will have a genetic tool, a DPR, for select for feed efficiency. Now, you agree with me that genetic variation is the cornerstone of genetic improvement, right? If a trait has no genetic variability, then we cannot change that phenotype through selection, right? It's key to have genetic variability. So this data, uh, it's one product of the uh, USDA uh, grant uh, led by uh, Mike Vanderhaar. This paper comes from the group of uh, Rob Templeman in MSU. Here we have genetic variability, uh, variance for <laughs> residual feed intake, the trait that um, our candidate trait for feed efficiency that Heather discussed. Here we have an alternative trait that is actually dry matter intake conditional on milk energy and metabolic body weight. Here you have the variability, genetic variability, the residual variance, and here the heritability. As you can see here, we have a heritability about 15%. That's great, right? So feed efficiency, if we measure feed efficiency as residual feed intake, is a heritable trait. And this, this estimate suggests that genetic selection can effectively improve feed efficiency through, uh, uh, through genetic improvement. Now, we say, well, but 15% is not too high, right, Pancho? What do you think? Well, I brought here the uh, table from the, um, you can find this in the CDCB webpage. These are the heritability estimates for different traits. As you can see here, we have the productive traits with heritabilities around 20%. But look at here, productive life as a heritability of only 8%. Somatic cell score as an indicator of other health, 12%. And our cow fertility trait, DPR, 4%. Conception rate, around 1%, 2%. Health, 1%. So with a heritability of 15%, we are great, right? Again, it's a heritable trait, and the heritability estimate suggests that we can improve dairy cow feed efficiency through genetic selection. That's, that's great. So why some cows are more efficient than others is our next question. So basically, why some cows need less feed than others of similar body weight and milk production? And Heather touched many of these points, and you will see I will touch more points later in my presentation. S just some, some thoughts from a geneticist, right? Maybe they digest feed better. Maybe they spend less energy on unproductive activities. We will know this using all the sensor data that James just, just present. Maybe they have a more efficient metabolism. I'm sure you can come up with different, uh, different reasons. So um, Joao invited me to talk about this idea of to try to decipher the genetic basis of feed, feed efficiency. Try to reveal what is the genetic basis of feed efficiency. So 
basically, the idea is to try to open the black box, right? The idea is to try to identify genetic variants, candidate genes, on biological pathways that actually are controlling feed efficiency. Now, a key question here, a key question of this presentation is why we want to decipher the genetic basis of feed efficiency. And at least I have three different reasons here. Maybe there are more, but at least there are three that are quite strong. One is to better understand the biology of this complex phenotype. I'm sure you agree with me, it's a very complex trait. So to better understand the biology. The second one is actually to try to generate some novel information that can lead to the development of new nutritional therapies, new drugs, new management. If we understand the biology, then we can help as a, nutrition, as a geneticist, sorry, to help, for example, nutritionists to develop novel strategies to improve feed efficiency. And the third one that is quite important is to develop novel genomic strategies for improving feed efficiency via selective breeding. Genetic selection, by definition, it's a black box, a quite close black box. Now, we know that if we somehow enrich that black box with some biological uh, information, we can achieve more accurate predictions. Part of my lab works on that, and the idea here is if we understand the biology, then we can use that information as, as a prior in some uh, genomic prediction models and improve predictive ability. So how do we decipher the genetic basis? This is, this is in general, right? So we need large numbers, large numbers of phenotypes, and of course we expect to have some phenotypic variation there. We need genotypes. We would like to have genome-wide SNP information from these animals, and that is quite simple. It's simple, but it's elegant. Well, at least you can create very beautiful plots, all right? The idea is to try to associate these SNPs that we, we genotype across the genome and try to see if there are genomic regions in the genome of the cow that explain a large variability in this uh, uh, phenotype of interest. In other words, we try to find either markers, or we can do it at the level of a, of a, a, a window that is somehow associated with that phenotype. If it is associated, it's because in that region, probably there is one or more candidate genes that actually are controlling the trait. So in the next uh, couple of slides, I will go over some genomic scans that the group um, has performed in recent years. I call this genomic scan, this genome-wide association study, this idea to have phenotypes and genotypes and try to find an association. This, uh, uh, Paper is, again, um, a product of the USDA grant. Lydia Hardy is here in the audience. Thanks, Lydia, for coming. So if you guys have any question, let's ask the first author here. And the paper, it's, um, it's from uh, Diane Spollock uh, group in um, Iowa State. So uh, Lydia used roughly 5,000 Holstein cows with uh, residual feed intake. The data is from uh, US, but she also used data from Canada, UK, and the Netherlands. And for this data set, we have roughly 57,000 SNPs across the genome. So here we have two plots. Bear with me, here in the top, we have uh, a genomic scan for primiparous cows, and here in the bottom, we have a genomic scan for multiparous cows, right? And here we are plotting, here in this, in this case are, are, are windows across the genome, so we go from chromosome one to chromosome 29, and the sex chromosome, and we try to calculate what is the percentage of genetic variance explained, but every window in the genome, right? Two important 
conclusions that we can take from this slide. First, based on this data, there is no window across the genome that explains more than 1% of the genetic variance for residual feed intake. In other words, it seems it's a highly polygenic trait with many, many genes with the small effects, right? The second one is, if you focus on these major peaks, there is no much overlap between what we observe in primiparous cows and what we observe in multiparous cows. That's extremely cool. The genetic correlation for residual feed intake between primiparous and multiparous cows is 76%. It's quite large, right? But it's different from one. So this means that at least there are some genes, some genetic mechanisms that are different between primiparous cows and multiparous cows. And for sure, this deserves more uh, research. Now, if we focus in this major peak here that explain almost 1% of the genetic variance for primiparous, we observe this gene, that this gene is actually a beta-3 adrenergic receptor, and we know that the adrenergic receptors are implicated in the mobilization and the utilization of the energy, so it seems it's a strong candidate gene. And here, for multiparous cows, in this chromosome 4, this window is close to the gene that actually encodes the hormone leptin. And actually, leptin is a um, major regulation, uh, regulator of uh, energy balance. So it's a highly polygenic trait with many genes with uh, uh, small effects. It seems some of the genes that, that control feed efficiency in multiparous and um, primiparous cows are different, and we have some strong candidate genes here. So this is what we observe in a highly polygenic trait. Let me show you what we expect to observe in another trait, milk production, that it's also a highly polygenic trait but with few major players, with few major genes. This is data from my lab, but any lab will always detect the same. Two, a, a big major peak here, where is DGAT1, that explains almost 6% for, for uh, the genetic variance of, of a productive trait, and another peak here explaining almost 1%, that is where uh, we have the gene for growth hormone receptor. Here yeah, is just to show you a different trait that you will see in a classical Manhattan plot that has a completely different profile. It's still a highly polygenic trait, but with some major players. Here you agree with me, it's a highly polygenic. We have some candidate genes, but nothing explaining more than 1% of the genetic variance. This is a, a, a second genomic scan. This is also a product of the USDA grant. This paper was published last week, so it's brand new. Um, this this uh, paper is actually from the USDA group, Erin Connor, Paul Van Raden, and John Cole. They used 4,000 cows only from US that what they did is they impute genotype data and they use a high density SNP data with almost 300,000 SNP across the genome, right? Previously, we used 57,000 genes. Now we are using almost 300,000. And if you um, um, check, here I have Again, a Manhattan plot where you have the chromosome from 1 to 29. This is the amount of genetic variance. This is a clear picture, a picture for, for a book when you are trying to talk about a highly polygenic trait with many, many genes with, no, uh, with, with small effects, right? No major 
uh, no major uh, players, no major genes. This is our data from Florida. I did my homework before coming. The difference here is I, we use a single market regression. So instead of fitting all the SNPs at the same time and actually try to detect regions based on genetic variants, we actually fit one market at a time and then we perform a formal statistical test to find a potential association. As you can see here, there are no major peaks. I will go over the two most important ones. This SNP is quite interesting because it's in the middle of two genes. This gene is a transcription factor. A transcription factor is an extremely pleiotropic gene, right? Because it can impact many, many traits. And the second gene is quite interesting because it's in the signaling pathway of T3 and T4. And we know that uh, thyroid hormones are implicated in growth, in development, and in metabolism. And this gene here, it's um, actually this gene encodes for uh, what we call a cytochrome P450 enzyme. Those are enzymes that are involved in cholesterol, esteroids, and other lipids, uh, the synthesis of other lipids. And this plot, I brought it because it's very cool. It's based on this. Here, basically, what we are plotting is what we observe in terms of the significance of each marker and what we expect under the new hypothesis that there is no association. And this plot is extremely cool because you see, if you walk, there are 50,000 points here. Almost all the points are under the new hypothesis that there is no association. There are very few at the end that are exactly this one that actually show some type of significant association, uh, observed value larger than expected under the new hypothesis. So three different genomic scans, it's clear that uh, residual feed intake is a polygenic trait with many genes, few, um, um, with, with a small effect, very few uh, major genes. Now, we know that uh, these uh, genomic scans are very valuable tools, but when we perform a GWAS, we have to focus in, on the genetic markers with the strongest evidence of association, and these, these markers explain a small component of the genetic variance. So there is something uh, uh, cool that we call the pathway analysis that is actually a post-GWAS approach that's actually, we test the association of a set of functionally related genes. And when we, set a, when we test a set of functionally related genes, we actually, we are trying to consider uh, uh, multiple factors at the same time. And it's a very elegant tool if we want to identify mechanisms and pathways underlying these complex phenotypes. And I'm bringing here data from the paper that was published last last week from the um, USDA group. They did perform a pathway analysis. Probably you don't read what is going on here. Let me summarize because this is in perfect agreement with what uh, Heather discussed later. These are the most relevant mechanisms that it seems they are controlling feed efficiency. Biosynthesis of amino acids, metabolism of proteins, digestion of sugars, uh, muscle development, immunity, rumen bacteria activity, and mitochondrial electron transport. And I will focus only on today on the mitochondrial function. And actually, I will talk about the mitochondrial function on the liver. This data comes from uh, beef cattle. I have five minutes. Um, this data comes from, from, uh, from beef cattle. It's something that for sure we have to do research in our lactating cows. But uh, it's known that uh, uh, steers with low residual feed intake, that means more efficient uh, animals, they have a greater mitochondrial density in the liver. They have a greater mitochondrial function in the liver. They have a greater antioxidant capacity, and they have lower oxidative stress. 
So maybe when we ask the question why some cows are more efficient than others, maybe part of that explanation is in the liver at the level of the mitochondrial function. This is no new for, for us. Genomic selection is the latest uh, uh, revolution in, in the dairy industry. Um, has caused the most remarkable change in dairy cattle breeding since the introduction of um, artificial um, uh, insemination. Now, genomics has also facilitated the selection for traits that are very difficult or very expensive to measure on the entire population, but are extremely important. For example, feed efficiency. Because we can, through genomics, it's a very, um, a very uh, elegant approach, because we can take a records on a, a relatively small uh, group of lactating dairy cows, feed intake, body weight, and milk energy output, and we combine with genotype data, data, and we use this small reference population to predict genomic PTA values for feed efficiency for the entire population, including uh, young selection candidates. So genomics has facilitated, actually, the selection for these kind of traits, like feed efficiency. Because we can use a relatively small reference population where we have records and genotypes. These records, by definition, should be measured on research facilities, right? We cannot measure individual feed intake on commercial farms. And then use this small reference population to predict breeding values to the entire population. And the group has worked on this. This is a, pa uh, uh, a paper from Chen Shao. We, sh we share the office with Chen uh, for four years. Um, this is also a uh, product of the USDA grant. And this, this paper comes from the group of uh, Kent Weigel. Please focus here. Within, the idea was to perform a genomic prediction of residual feed intake using what we call a cross-validation approach. So we train the model in a subset of the data and we predict in a completely different subset. This is within because it's only using data from North America. And you see that the author achieved predictive uh, correlations around 20% for residual feed intake and milk energy and around 23 for milk uh, dry matter intake and almost 40% uh, for metabolic body weight. So predictive correlations in cross-validation in the way that we should do it around 20%. The other thing that we learned from this data that I think is very cool is it doesn't matter much if we add data from Scotland or if we add that data from the Netherlands, as you can see here, we do not boost our predictive uh, correlations. And here we have the distribution of these uh, uh, genomic estimated breeding values. This is the distribution of genomic breeding values for roughly 16,000 bulls. This was predicted using a reference population of um, 3,500 cows. It's a beautiful plot. Nice distribution, but see the variability here. There is almost 400 kilos of difference between what we call the top bulls and what we call the uh, bottom uh, uh, or less efficient animals. This is data again from Chen Shao and Kent Wagel. Again, there is genetic variability. We can exploit that genetic variability. My take home messages today. Feed efficiency is an economically relevant trait. Residual feed intake as a candidate for feed efficiency is a heritable trait, around 50%. I show you herita uh, heritability estimate for other traits that we select every day in our selection programs. 15% is not bad at all. Um, and genetic selection is first a very powerful tool, and with this uh, estimate, there is, uh, we can use that to effectively improve dairy feed efficiency. 
I'm sure you agree with me, residual feed intake is highly polygenic, many genes with a small effect. I show you what we expect when we do the same for uh, uh, milk production. It's a, it's, it's a different type of, of plot. We are learning that there are some relevant biological mechanisms actually controlling feed efficiency, metabolism of proteins and sugars, rumen bacteria activity, mitochondrial function. For sure, we need to do research here. Genomic predictive correlations are around 20%, but the future is good for us, right? Because in the future, we will have more feed intake records, so we will have more reliable genomic predictions. Without, thanks for your attention. Uh, I don't know if Peggy wants to kill me or not. Uh, <laughs> But we will have questions uh, at the end, right? Yes, we'll hold questions for the panel that will begin shortly Thank you. after our next presenter. Thank you so much. <laughs>